Hello, hello, and welcome to your webinar for July 26, 2016 for the School for Wizards. And um, what we are going to do today is explore the nature of reality. So be get ready to explore the nature of reality with me because it's going to be quite a ride. I have work from leading uh, metaphysicians and parapsychologists, inc including the work of uh, a bunch of scientists as well. So let's get started. I'm going to bring some slides up here. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to do that by first sharing the screen, which is going to look really psychedelic for just a moment. And uh, I'm going to, um, and I'm going to start with a quote. And uh, let's go into slideshow mode. Let's see if that works. We are led astray by our errant sense of understanding. And scientists are no more immune to this phenomenon than the common person. The history of science is a story of false explanations that people knew to be true. So we have to ask. How can we know when our explanation, our scientific theory, is true? And this is from J.D. Trout, who is a professor of psychology and philosophy at Loyola University, Chicago. So here, J.D. Trout is already putting the first chink into our assumption that, um, that scientific theory is actually correct and trustable. And here's Arthur C. Clarke. I found a, a, a shorter and easier to understand version of the quote that I like to put, which is, magic is just technology we don't understand yet. Magic is just technology we don't understand yet. So, um, and then one more, W. William Butler Yeats, in a letter to John O'Leary, said, mystical life is at the center of all that I do and all that I think and all that I write. And that, my friends, is at the center of all that I do and all that I think and all that I write as well. And um, in the School for Wizards, this is a habit that we, um, a habit that we, um, that we cultivate and develop. So welcome to How to Change Reality Itself. And I'm gonna tell you now the, again, we're just filled with quotes. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a really important one, and you've seen it on the registration to this webinar. All matter is merely energy condensed to a slow vibration. We are all one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. There is no such thing as death. Life is only a dream, and we are the imagination of ourselves. This is Bill Hicks. So I acknowledge you, I acknowledge you for even having an inkling that you're already a wizard. Now, I believe that you're a wizard, and I believe that you've always been a wizard, that you were born a wizard, and that there are just some things that they forgot to teach you when you were younger. That's all. Or maybe some things that you already knew but forgot. Now, I would love to tell you at this point more about my journey. Um, and I would like to tell you why I'm so excited and thrilled about teaching about the nature of reality and the elastic and plastic nature of reality. So I'm going to first do that by talking about the zone of necessity. Now, this is a magical zone. I've, I've coined this phrase myself, the, the zone of necessity. And in the zone of necessity, when it gets turned on in my life, means that whatever I want will come to pass. And I have to be very careful because the universe will deliver me what I want um, in whatever means it sees fit. So I'll give you an example of that kind, kind of zone of necessity and why I have to be very care, careful about turning it on. Um, because uh, I recently wanted a, a new car and I, and I was like, oh, I don't have the money for a new car, but I really want a new car. And I was trying to keep myself out of the zone of necessity. 
but I realized that I had crossed over, that it was just like, okay, must have a new car now. And I was driving back uh, to Davenport, California from San Francisco, and it was probably 1.30 or 2 in the morning, and I hadn't had sleep for several days. And I dozed off for just a microsecond at the wheel on a uh, windy, stormy, rainy night on Highway 1, and my car slid across two lanes of traffic. The wheels, the front and back wheels, paralleled a drainage ditch, leapt over another drainage ditch without flipping, and landed in a tree, like just in the arms of a tree. And the tree cushioned the impact such that um, I was unharmed, not even a scratch. No whiplash, no scratch, no nothing. The car was totaled. Um, and for some reason, right, the zone of necessity kicking in, the, <laughs> the, the insurance company paid me almost double the blue book value for my car. So when that happened, then I could actually get the Prius that I'd always wanted. And, um, and I usually don't tell people this story, but when we went in to look at the Prius, um, I just got in the first car that I found. You know, they, they said, okay, here's one, and it's one with the, with the package that you want. And I hopped in it, and I'm like, I like it. And the person I was dri or, what, driving the car with, you know, I brought somebody to the, to the dealership, and, and, they, and they said, well, it can't be this easy to buy a car. I said, well, yeah, can. <laughs> Zone of necessity kicked in. And I want to tell you also about a, a relationships that I have with birds. It's very, very strange. Now, I didn't ask to be the bird guy. I don't know why I'm the bird guy. But um, birds have always appeared to me, um, as I'm realizing now. Um, I used to go out and s smoke when I was a member of the corporate world. I, yes, I was a smoker. And um, I'd, I'd go out to the little zone where, where you could smoke, and all these morning doves would be, you know, kind of flying around at my feet, and, you know, just they were in the square while I was down there. And, and one day I complained about this to my coworker, and I said, you know, why are there all those birds down there? It's great out there, but there are all those birds. And she said, well, I've never seen any birds out there. And I realized that the, the birds only came down when I was out there. Um, I thought, well, I don't have a particular affinity for birds, but they apparently have one for me. And uh, I'll tell you a story that, that I swear this is true. It's like this is not the kind of story that you can make up. But I had, I had prepared a, a candle uh, with symbols to indicate, you know, magical intention. And, and, and the instruction was to burn the candle when you wanted the prayers to take place. And they were prayers about, like, you know, being more light for the world and, you know, just really, you know, it was a very spiritual prayer. And I was burning a candle and working in the basement of my house and um, and I suddenly, you know, my back was kind of turned to the candle. I knew it was burning and I heard this sound. It was like, brr, brr. and I turned around and couldn't, didn't know where the sound was coming from. And I said to my partner who was down there with me, I said, well, what's that sound? And he says, well, it's the computer. And I said, well, my computer's not on. And he said, I don't know what it is. So I walk out to the place where the candle is burning and there is a morning dove, the same species of bird that you see here, the morning dove, sitting next to the candle, just sitting there. And it had apparently flown into the house and been drawn to the energy, uh, the spiritual energy of that candle. And I still to this day do not know why I did this, but I just raised up my hand to the bird, like I just raised my arm up to the bird and it flew, but it flew over to me and it landed on my head, just like it just landed right on the top of my head. And I walked to the door with the bird on top of my head and it just flew off into the, into the yard. And I was like, wow, I have never had anything like that happen in my life. So that's the way my, my world is right now. Um, but, and, and I have to say that I was always 
a wizard. You know, I grew up in a little hobbit house um, that was surrounded by woods because my parents um, decided that they weren't going to cut down the big trees around us. And we went to church every Sunday. Um, and then we'd go home to the little hobbit house. And, and it was, uh, you know, Southern Baptist Church where you had to go and confess your sins to Jesus, you know, as you as you do, right? And I, I hadn't done it. And I was about eight or nine years old, you know, maybe the the uh, age of that kid in the you know third row back. And and I I I suddenly I felt that you know they were singing the, the doxology, you know, like praise God from whom all blessings flow. And you know, and you know, the music was swelling, and the choir was singing its heart out. And I just felt like this. I felt the it was kind of like the Holy Spirit entered me, and I was like, "Yes, I'm going to go do this." I'm going to. I was trying to figure out what to say to the preacher, and and um, and then I heard a voice, I, like an audible voice, and it said, "Not here. This is not your church. Not now." And I thought, "Well, okay." What I made up to myself was that God told me not to do this because I had another way, and apparently. The other way was the school for wizards. But I have to say, this is not the house I grew up in. <laughs> Our house was a little bit bigger and a little bit more plain than the Hobbit house that you see here. Um, but it was kind of in this wooded area. And actually, the trees were much bigger than the trees here. And you have to get that. It was like lawn, lawn, forest, lawn, right? You know, as you as you drove down the street um, to to look at my house, and no grass would actually grow on the underneath all these trees because there was just too much shade. And actually, there were set somewhere between seven and nine old, very old, like oak and sweet gum, and and other uh, hardwood trees that were very, very big. And they were the biggest trees in the whole neighborhood, like in the whole surrounding area. And we lived in a kind of a sinkhole place, you know, where there was, was water that would come through in the winter when it would rain and, uh, and make a little river in the backyard. So it was like very sort of saturated ground, uh, making it the perfect place for lightning to strike. So lightning struck every one of those trees one at a time, and they had to be taken down. Um, my father barely escaped being struck by lightning several times as he would run to the house as lightning would strike the trees. But my parents were very sort of hands off as parents. The pictures of me when I was a little kid show me propped up on pillows or kind of held at arm's length or in a playpen while my parents read the paper. And so it was not a pleasant thing. So when I was a teenager, I finally ran away after several runaway attempts. I finally ran away permanently, and I went essentially from here to here, right? This is actually the city that I ran away to. This is Atlanta, Georgia, and it was a big, dangerous city, and I sort of self, I self um, initiated, as we call it. I self initiated, and boy, was it ever <laughs> A powerful initiation, but at the end of the time of my time there, I had a job as a custom painter in a statuary factory, and I uh, had my own apartment. Um, lived with a couple of guys, and and uh, I, I I I was happy, but I knew that I if I was not going to have a high school education, I would only be able to work at this minimum wage statuary job or something like it for the rest of my life. So I decided to go back to school the next year, but I was liberated. I was changed. I had bought the world's best pair of platform boots and I came back and like, I'm going to just show you, this as an example. Um, I would wear all black to school one day and, and this sort of long overcoat look was, was very uh, much like what I would do. You know, um, I wasn't, particularly gothy because they didn't have the goth distinction when I was in school, but it was, I was as close as you could get. And then the next day I would wear all white, just like this picture of Brad Pitt on the right, except for 
I would wear, and I would wear sometimes these odd, you know, sort of see-through or diaphanous or, or oddly cut things. And I would wear like big amulets around my neck and stuff. And so, you know, when I got back, my parents were afraid of me, the other uh, kids were afraid of me, and I felt like I had actually found my power, my, my magical power. Um, and I had defied reality, right? The subject of today's talk is, is the na changing the nature of reality itself. I basically had run away at 15, gotten a job, found my way in the world, right? Nobody would even believe I was 15. They all thought I was 21. So I, I'm gonna promise you two things today. Um, two, two intentions. And, um, and the first one is to give you everything I've got for an hour. Just, I'm gonna, and there's, there may be some drinking from the fire hose here, and I apologize, but there is a lot of information that I want to get, impart to you about the nature of reality because it's way more elastic than you thought. The second thing is I want to let you know that I will let you know how to work with me further. There's an exciting thing that I want to tell you about at the end of the webinar that, uh, that we are doing in Southern California. Hint, hint. So here I want to, and I want to say this to you. I am a wizard, okay? Uh, but I want you to really get that that when I say I am a wizard, I mean you are a wizard. So I want you to say, even if you say it under your breath, I am a wizard, right? I am a wizard. What does that mean? The wizard comes from the old term wise ard, meaning wise one. And you were a wise one when you were born. And you've you've, <laughs> yeah, you know what's happened. So I want you to imagine what it's, what, it, what it's like, what it would be like if you had already been altering the nature of reality, of your reality and of reality, all the reality around you for a year. Like, what are you doing at the end of that time? I want you to really get into imagining that because we're going to talk about how to do this. So how are you altering the nature of reality. Well, what are you doing that's magical a year from now? What are you having? What are you doing? You can close your eyes if you want. You can keep your, you know, keep your eyes open. I, I don't care. But just like this is the magical wand moment, right? The magic wand moment is imagine you have a magic wand and you can do this. What will it be like? And now, how much are you altering the nature of your reality right now? Some of you might be doing a lot, or you might be doing a little. What are you doing? What are you having right now? Right? Are you having the magic in your life that you want? Just, I just wanted you to, to, to tune you into that. Now, I'm going to give you some definitions. And I'm going to introduce you to some people. Okay, the first definition that some of you might know is epistemology. Now, because we're doing some epistemology here, right? Epistemology is the theory of knowledge. Now, they say, especially with regard to methods, validity, and scope, right? But here is the piece that I think is the most important. Epistemology is the investigation of what justifies, what, I'm sorry, what distinguishes justified belief from opinion. What justifies, what distinguishes justified belief from opinion, right? And we're, we're going to see how science is not as um, firm about this as even it thinks it is. So I want to, the first person I want to introduce you to is a person named Minard Kuhlman. This is Minard Kuhlman. He's a young, well, relatively young, I suppose, PhD. And here's what Minard Kuhlman has come up with, is a theory of what is called trope ontology. And, and I'm not going to give you the complicated 
um, answer to this. I want you to actually just hold these ideas in your mind, maybe take some notes on them. But here's the thing about trope ontology. Um, the particle interpretation of quantum physics, the way that we're looking at particles as the basic building blocks of the universe, it stretches our conventional notions of particle and field to such an extent that more and more people are beginning to believe that the world might be made of something else entirely. So uh, for years I have thought, and I haven't been a physicist, and I so I haven't had the tools to look at this, but thank goodness for people like Mike Kuhlman, because I've always said we are looking in the wrong direction. If we just keep looking smaller and smaller and smaller, that, that's not the, the, the direction that we, that we need to go in, right? So here's what Maynard Kuhlman has essentially said, is that the universe is made up of qualities, not particles, but qualities. And the qualities would be things like color and shape and elasticity and size, and not particles at all. So that you would describe a red rubber ball as having the qualities of redness and roundness and a certain type of elasticity and size and a, and a host of other things. But when you had given all the properties or qualities of the object, then it would, it would be described. And so perhaps those are the building blocks of the universe. And there are physicists, and I was going to say physical, but I mean physicist kind of things that, um, that people like Minard Coleman do uh, to prove this from a physics point of view. But I want to, um, in, a, in a moment, I'm going to introduce you to someone named J.D. Trout who uh, talks about what science is really up to. But let's just, for a moment, say that there's something wrong with evolution. Now, I'm not saying there's something wrong with our evolution. I'm saying there's something wrong with evolutionary theory. Now, I'm not, uh, I am not advocating any other theory in its place. Although there are people that I'm gonna introduce you to in just a moment who are going to, um, to do that, right? They're going to tell us what the problems are with evolutionary theory and what we're going to do about it. So it has a raft of unanswered questions. And before I introduce you to Rupert Sheldrake, I want to introduce you to two other people. So let's just say that there's something wrong with evolution, there's something wrong with physics, there's something wrong with the way that we see the world. But there has always been something wrong with that. So remember the J.D. Trout quote I, I told you in the beginning, History, that the history of science is a story of false explanations that people knew to be true. Thomas Kuhn wrote a, um, a book, which I may misquote the title of. I believe it's The History of Scientific Revolutions, uh, or it could be The History of Scientific Discovery. But Thomas Kuhn basically um, and I'll, I'll spare you reading the giant book, but it's a really excellent book if you want to read it. Um, so what Thomas Kuhn says in that book is that, um, is that, let's say Newtonian physics, right? You know, Newton had ideas about how things worked. And and we fit, and and the people of, of his age said, "Wow, this is new and exciting. This is really the way things are." And then um, the theory of relativity comes along with Einstein, and Einstein said, "Well, this is really how it works. You know that Newtonian stuff is is all old hat." And everyone said, "Oh yeah, yeah, the new Newtonian stuff is is no good anymore because the relativity relativity is is how it." And it really happens. It's how it really goes. And then um, after that, quantum physics and quantum mechanics began to be the way that people, because you know, there were these things that couldn't be explained by the theory of relativity. Now, does Newtonian physics still work? Yes. 
Does the theory of relativity still work? Yes. Does quantum theory explain things? Yes. But in every one of those theories, there were problems that had not yet been addressed, right? So hopefully the nature of reality is, is beginning to be unplugged a little bit for you, right? Because these scientific things are theories and they really nicely explain the experience that we're having. And we'll talk about why this, this is happening um, throughout the rest of the, of the webinar. But J.D. Trout and Thomas Kuhn are both um, in agreement that the theories of science are not talking about how reality really is. So I'm going to introduce you to someone right now who you may already know. Uh, Rupert Sheldrake is still alive, born on the 20th of June in 1942, who came up with a theory of morphogenetic fields. And I'll just tell you a little brief thing about Rupert Sheldrake because we've got a, a, a lot more to cover. Rupert said, uh, noticed some things. One of the things that he noticed was that, that and this is true, and no, no science has, until R Rupert Sheldrake came up with this theory, was able to explain this, is that when you create a compound in one part of the world, like if it's a new compound that's never been created before, and you know, chemists are always doing this, they'll put together some things that have never been put together before, and then, and then some reaction happens. Well, this is the truth. The first time that reaction happens, it takes a certain amount of time. The second time that reaction happens, no matter where in the world it is, it happens significantly faster. And you have to get this. The first time that it's created anywhere in the world, it's slow. The second time, even if it's on the other side of the planet, and it, even if it's 10 minutes later, it's faster. So what Rupert Sheldrake has postulated is that, the, and there are, there's a lot of complicated stuff you can find on rupertsheldrake.com or .org. You can read as much as you want about him, but essentially he's saying that there are these fields, that, that a morphogenetic field or a morphic field gets created around, the, the, around that compound and because there's a template for it now in the world, it can actually be experienced, right? More quickly because there's a template for it already. The first time the template for it is being made. And he considers the, the history of evolution to be a history of habits and that those habits are passed on to, to, uh, to others. And, um, and, the, the, and that evolution is about the changing of fields of these morphogenetic fields over time. And, you know, Rupert Sheldrake's done a book call, uh, about, you know, why pets know when the owners are coming home like far in advance of any sensory information, et cetera. He's, he's done some amazing work in the world and I encourage you to look at the work that Rupert Sheldrake has done because he's one of the scientists that we call the looking glass scientists who are looking at things from the opposite way that we usually do. Now I want to introduce you to someone else, right? So just drink from the fire hose. It's, you just realize that this is all about changing the nature of reality. So David Bohm, scientist born in 1917, died in 1992. Aside from creating this wonderful thing called dialogue, which we may do a whole separate webinar about at some point, he actually had a theory of the enfolding universe, and he used a couple of, um, he used a couple of, he used actually four or five different things to, to tell about it. And I'm only going to talk to you about two of them. Um, so the so imagine that the universe that enfolding is like folding up, and unfolding is un, is unfolding like a an orga, or an origami thing. So that the that the universe is constantly folding up and unfolding. And he's, he had some ideas about the way that time worked. So here's an experiment that works. It, you can actually do this experiment. It works for, for different reasons, but he used this to explain the way 
the universe works. So here's what, what can happen. Like the inner cylinder in this diagram is uh, turnable. The outer cylinder stays stationary. And in between the inner cylinder and the outer cylinder in this kind of donut shape is a bunch of glycerin, right? You know, it's a viscous liquid, like clear jelly. And if you take a pipette and introduce a little drop of dye into this, uh, into the center of this thing, and then you take that crank on the top and you crank it, then that dye drop um, sort of disappears into the, it, like it basically gets dissipated into the glycerin. It's no longer a single drop. But here's the thing. If you turn that crank backwards, the dye drop will reconstitute. Right? It will turn back into a dye drop. And like I said, it works. this works for different reasons, but what he uses it to illustrate is that this is the way mo moments in time are, that, that actually time is reversible. You can go backwards and forwards, and that our moments are, you know, if you sped this up really fast, we would have like a dye drop here that it would then get dissipated, a dye drop here gets dissipated, and it looks, if you speed that up fast enough, it looks like the dye drop is moving through space. But in fact, what's happening is a, a completely different phenomenon. So, all right, if your mind is not already blown enough, uh, I want to introduce you to a problem that I'm not going to take the time to explain, but it is called the particle wave problem in theoretical physics. And so th there's a lot of complicated data here, but you don't need to know any of that. All you need to know is that sometimes light acts like a wave, as the top illustration. Sometimes light acts like a particle. And scientists have been puzzled for years about this thing called the particle wave problem. It's like, how is it that light can sometimes be like a wave and sometimes be like a particle? Well, David Bohm's answer to that is that, that it is as if we are looking at a fish in an aquarium. But we can't actually see the fish in the aquarium. We can only see the monitors of two video cameras. And one video camera is looking in one direction. The other video camera is looking in the other direction. And so we're looking at the fish on the left and the fish on the right, and we think they're two different fishes. And so we go, look, there's a relationship between these two fishes. Like when this fish swims toward us, that fish swims to the left. Oh, how about that? There's a relationship between them. But what he's saying is that it's the same thing and that we don't have the capacity as human beings to. Uh, to see that it's really one thing we're looking at. So this is some, some of the work in theoretical physics that's being done to kind of blow up the nature of reality. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start down another road right now, and that road is the road toward the paranormal, because I actually think that the paranormal supersedes science, right? It's a larger uh, area, and I think by the end of the webinar, you may, in fact, agree with me. So first, let's look at uh, J.B. Rhine. Now, J.B. Rhine was the guy that did these psychic studies at Duke University, and I think he did them in the 40s or 50s. He was like, okay, I'm curious about science, and I'm going to you know, have people turn over these cards and look at the cards and think really hard and we're going to isolate them in rooms and make the whole thing be very clinical and sterile. And modern um, researchers now say this about him. They say that what he really accomplished by operationalizing psychical, and that's not physical, that's psychical research, and insisting on controlled laboratory conditions and statistical approaches. He figured out how to suppress psi and finally make it go away. And you'll see, like, by the time we get to the last person in our pantheon here, you'll see that, in fact, um, psychic phenomenon actually um, result in, oh, how do I say this? Um, 
th that psychic phenomenon require um, the emotions and the and erotic or sexual energy, um, not necessarily both at the same time, but they require the whole self to be present for them. And uh, just like our mind and body is a uh, 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 is actually a combination. Uh, the different aspects of ourselves are really one thing. Um, so, ready to meet someone new? Okay, that is J.B. Ryan. So, er, much earlier is Frederick Myers, and Frederick Myers, I, he's the only one I don't have actually birth and death dates to, but he was uh, living in the latter half of the 19th century to the early part of the 20th century, and he was born in 1875 or something. So he wrote a very famous book called The Human Personality and Its Survival After Death. And just as a side note, um, if you Google Frederick Myers and Survival After Death, there is a um, a, a publication that claims that he was actually able to um, transmit information to several psychics over a period of 20 or 30 years that were all said to be sent to a central location and, create, and created into a book about the afterlife. Now, this is unscientific and unverified, but um, you can explore that, uh, your, your magical selves, if you wish. But here's what Frederick Myers did. He, and, and I have to say that when Frederick Myers and Charles Fort were doing this work, psychical research was actually a valid form of research because there are paranormal phenomena. And rather than science closing the door on them and saying, okay, it can't be explained by the rules that we have, we'll just ignore it. Or we'll claim that it doesn't matter or we will claim that the people were hallucinating or some way to make it happen it's it's very much like when uh, spontaneous healing occurs western medical doctors are not trained to respond to spontaneous healing at no time will well i don't know, know if this is true now because times are changing a bit but it used to be in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, that when you spontaneously healed, like a, you know, if, you, your, if your brain tumor suddenly went away or your cancer was suddenly in complete remission without any treatment whatsoever, then here's what the doctor would say. We made a misdiagnosis. Because if they were to admit that spontaneous healing occurred, then they would have to go into territory that they were unwilling to go into. So, so very similar to this, paris, paranormal things occur. And the study of those things was actually a science. And, um, and you know, sometimes a maligned science, as many things, you know, come and go in terms of... Um, Many things come and go in terms of popularity, but but I think it's personally a shame that um, that paranormal research went by the wayside, and we can thank Charles Fort for having a good um, a good attitude about it in the in the very least. So there's a there is a word that I that Frederick Myers actually coined a lot of words that are commonly used now, but one one of the ones that we hardly ever hear is a word called telesthesia. Now, telesthesia is the mind's ability to access information at a distance without any receiving or sending mind on the other end, as opposed to telepathy. And I'm not going to include the definition of telepathy in the slides, but telepathy is the mind's ability to access information from a sending mind, right? You're the receiving mind and the send, or you're the sending mind on the other end, right? Telepathy is, uh, is a kind of empathy at a distance. And this is something that you want to start getting through your, your head. Um, Frederick Myers 
research uh, was for an organization called the Institute of Psychical Research, centered in England, and he asked for people to send him reports of paranormal activities. And the Institute for Psychical Research was very scientific because they threw away 95% of the letters that were written in. Some were, were written in by cranks, some were written in by unverified sources. So what they had, the requirements that they had were very stringent. The event had to be, uh, had to have been witnessed by more than one person and the witnesses had to agree on what they had had seen to, to one extent or another. Um, and as you know, witness accounts vary even when, when the thing that's been, that's being described is not paranormal. So, um, so the, the, the members of this group would write hundreds of letters per day and the research was, was huge. Um, and, uh, and, and they began to believe that there actually was basis for, um, uh, telesthesia, telepathy and, and other things. So the takeaway, uh, so what they also noticed is that every one of the incidents that seemed to be real, you know, that seemed to actually be a real expression of the paranormal. And this was during the time when seances were happening all the time, and um, uh, and you know some mediums were clearly fakes and some were not. So there was a lot, the field. Once you get into the invisible world, the field is ripe with you know people who are not actually authentic. Um, but the thing that Frederick Myers recognized and realized was that, in fact. Every case, there was strong emotion or erotic energy, right? So that's the takeaway for Frederick Myers. Successful psychic activity is linked to emotions and erotic energy. So <clears throat> a little bit later in time, from 1874 to 1932, we have a gentleman named Charles Fort. And Charles Fort was a, a, a researcher with boundless energy. And you, you have to get Charles Fort because he, you know, he had a great sense of humor. I'm going to give you some of his quotes in just a second. So, um, so he believed that we lived in a, in a space that he eventually called the absolute positive or the between, in a space between something that he called the absolute positive and the absolute negative. Um, so for Charles Fort, well, I'll tell you more about that in a second. Let me just tell you about his uh, research methods. So this is actually the home of Charles Fort. Um, and uh, it is now, this is a modern photograph of it, but you can tell that it was a modest home. And, and it was an apartment that was filled to the brim with shoe boxes that were filled with reports and he decided to research everything that happened in because he spoke both French and English he decided to take everything from the year 1800 to the present time and research the newspapers of every city for every day looking for unusual activities right and so what he discovered was that there were so many of them you know that it was that it filled literally his entire apartment, and um, and and he wrote several books. S several of the most famous writers of the time considered him the genius of the time, and um, and this is something typical of what Charles Fort would say: the outrageous is reasonable if introduced politely. <laughs> And here's something that is actually re related to the material that we're covering today. One can't be of an inquiring and experimental nature and still be very sensible. Right? One can't be of an inquiring mind and still be very sensible. So in this sense, he's very similar to 
some physicists who've come along later, including Rudy Rucker, who wrote a book called Flatland. So he says, and this is a quote from him, I'd suggest to start with that we put ourselves in the place of deep sea fishes. How would they account for the fall of animal matter from above? They wouldn't try. Or it's easy enough to think of most of us as deep sea fishes of a kind, right? So he, what he's saying is that, 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 you know, we are essentially living in a kind of flat land. There's a world going on around us that we don't understand. These odd instances are, are telling us that we do, and we choose just to simply ignore it all the time. Now, he believed that both science and religion were a form of fundamentalism which reduced choices. And if you think about it, it's true. The choice of religion is to say, oh, it's a miracle and God did it, right? It's a miracle and God did it. It's a very easy way to get out of anything that happened. The way of science is to say, oh, well, the person who this happened to was deluded or there's some scientific explanation for it that we haven't discovered yet, but most of the time it's science's main tool when it comes to the paranormal is denial or, or um, reducing everything to a single equal sign. And if it doesn't fit to one side or the other of the equal sign, then it's not worth studying. So ultimately this is about the way that we see the universe. Will we allow science or religion to explain unexplained moments using this narrow set of criteria that I just described? Or do we allow the mysterious to remain mysterious, opening up our minds to more and more impossible phenomenon? Here's another quote from Charles Fort. Somebody in France in the year 1842 told of slow-moving stones. And somebody in Sumatra in the year 1903 told of slow moving stones. It would be strange if two liars should invent this circumstance. And this is where I get when I reason. Charles Fort. So the takeaway for Charles Fort, and I told you we were drinking from the fire hose today, takeaway for Charles Fort is that understanding the universe means allowing the weird not trying to explain it with science or religion. And frankly, neither science nor religion has done a very good job so far. So I'm gonna give you some uh, NLP convictions on the next slide. Um, and NLP is this vast um, body of knowledge which deserves its own webinar as well, which we'll probably do one on, on NLP and the magic of NLP. But um, here are some things to note. We do not experience the world directly, but through our, map make, through our maps of the world. And this is a quote from the, uh, from the theorist Korzybski. The map is not the territory. So we make these maps and we respond to the maps, but we're not responding directly to the territory. Right? People are like map makers of reality. And the way that we make these maps, and this is so important, especially based on what we've just covered in the webinar, we generalize, we delete, we distort. Right? And when you're making a map, you have to, because you're making a map on a two-dimensional surface of a three-dimensional and living thing. Right? So the, the, the paper map is to reality like our maps of reality are that we think are reality. And in, in essence, we don't react to the world, but to our maps of the world. And so what I didn't put in here, and I should have, is when we change our maps, we change our reality. When we change our maps, we change our reality because that is what we are using to react. And, and, and here's the thing, we cannot experience the world but through our maps. And so when we change maps, we change 
the very nature of reality. And, and at this point, I think you'll begin to see that there is a that that there is a different way or many different ways of seeing how reality actually works. So here is the takeaway from the whole well, for the whole for the whole webinar and then I want to introduce you to, to something very amazing. So the takeaway for the webinar is science and the conclusions of science are ever changing, right? We want to start to take science with more of a grain of salt because science is presented as reality, but in fact, science is just another religion. And it's, it's so much safer to think that, okay, if something is scientifically proven, we, we end up a little bit in this world of like, Oh, well, if science isn't explaining exactly the way the world is, what is? Well, that's our, our opportunity as wizards to create the world that we want to create, right? To actually do the impossible because even science doesn't understand the actual laws and rules of nature. The other takeaway is that we um, don't see the world as it is, but through our maps of it. And the third is that we can be more resourceful, right? More magical when we open our minds to different maps. We can be more resourceful when we open our minds to different maps. So I wanna introduce you to something that, you know, many of you who are elsewhere in the world, um, you want to look at this. This is, a, this is an event that's happening in, in California, in Southern California, but you want to actually look at this as something that you want to do for yourself anyway. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna now uh, take us to a website. And here we go. This is a website called, the, this is my website, the School for Wizards. And, um, and this is an event that we're doing um, on the weekend after Labor Day. The, I believe it's the weekend of the 9th, 10th, and 11th of September. So two or so months away, one and a half months away. And most of us are actually ignoring most of the world, right? We have created maps that are largely visual, maps that ignore the uh, para parasympathetic input that we're getting, maps that ignore the rest of our senses. So we are going on an adventure of the senses. I call it the circus of the senses. And, um, and this first slide here is actually the interior of a building that you'll see later on. Um, and this building is, is called the Integratron. And it's in Southern California in a town called Landers. And um, uh, an ex-NASA scientist named uh, George Van Tassel, um, when he retired, he began to be interested in the alien uh, phenomenon. And what he believes is that the aliens downloaded the plans to him for this acoustically perfect space called the Integratron. And you'll see it's fairly big. It's, you know, about 30, 30 or 40 feet wide. Um, and it's a perfect dome and it has not one single nail in it. It was put together with wood and concrete, but no conductive um, stuff is in it at all. No nails are in the top part of the building at all. And, um, and in this acoustically perfect space, you can whisper at one side of the room, like literally a whisper that you can barely hear, and then you can hear it as if someone's whispering in your ear on the other side of the room. And what you see in the background here are crystal bowls. Now, what, what I have arranged with the Integratron to do is to um, be able to have private time. It's very hard to get private time in the Integratron because it's crowded with people wanting to have these sound baths in this acoustically perfect space. But there is magical um, energy available in the Integratron, which we are going to access by being in this room with this group, in, with our own group, not with anyone else, in private, in the Integratron. And I've secured us a spot 
uh, on the afternoon of Friday um, inside the Integratron. And so the purpose of the Integratron was to recharge energy into every living cell, so says George Van Tassel, to bring longer life, youthful energy. It's a, an electrostatic generator that would supply a broad range of frequencies to recharge ce cellular structure. Now the Integratron has gone unfinished, and there's a, a reason for that that I can tell you um, later. But this next image is the image of Giant Rock. This is the largest freestanding boulder in the continental United States. It's also very nearby. And what you see in front of it is a, um, a concrete pad that used to be the alien restaurant that George Van Tassel ran. And there was an underground room underneath the Giant Rock that had alien petroglyphs in it. And at some point in time, this large piece of the rock sheared off and it's hard to get a scale for this but a person standing here would not even reach up to this first uh, level right here um, it, it's it's a huge huge boulder and um, and it is said to have extremely uh, powerful energy for that reason and we are going to make a visit to giant rock and meditate around giant rock as as well um, so there is um, some testimonials here on the page if you're curious about people who have been to School for Wizards retreats and, um, and have things to say about it. Um, but here this image that you are beginning to see now is the Integratron from the outside. Um, it's just an amazing structure. It's out in the middle of the desert. So what we are going to do um, is engage all of the senses. So the Integratron is going to largely in, in integrate our sound sense and some of our invisible world sense. And we are going to be staying at the Tile House, which is a visual feast for the eyes. This is a great um, horned toad that is on some of the tile that's at the Tile House. Um, we are going to be exploring synesthesia or the combination of the senses. And this is the dining room area of the tile house and you can see the tile that sort of you know occupies every square inch of the inside of the place and it's not regular tile it's it's um wild and wacky art tile it's like being inside of a giant sculpture uh, we'll explore our sense of smell by using essential oils and um, flower essences and um and aromatherapy and we're going to slow down our systems to understand what's going on in the mind and the brain around the senses. Now the people that that this is for, um, oh, and also I wanna say something about the food. So we are going to be having sumptuously prepared meals um, every time the meals and accommodation are all supplied in this, uh, in this amazing th three day weekend and we are, it's not a weekend about like prepping you to, to purchase something. It really is a, about a weekend where we learn the missing parts of what we're, of what we're doing and also a, 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 a space where I will teach you and we will do every single day the meditation that Mozart did right before he composed music. And it's a meditation that engages all of the senses um, and we, we put so much attention to the visual sense and we are so visually overloaded most of the time anyway, that most of this um, workshop and retreat is going to be about um, our, um, our other senses, you know, our sense of smell, our sense of taste, our sense of feeling, our kinesthetic feeling and our, and our sense of hearing. And to that end, we are going to be having these amazing meals that are designed to get us to notice things that we haven't noticed before about the way that we eat. So, um, so the Tile House and the Integratron are about 20 miles away. We'll be making little trips. And you can actually, uh, oh, here's the other thing. It's by invitation only. So you are getting an invitation to this. If you wanna come, or if you think you wanna come, then just put down a $150 deposit because I'm only taking 12 people on this trip because the accommodations will only hold 12 and the, and the Integratron, I spoke with them and they said, you know, like the, you know, 12 is about the ideal number for them. 
So I'm only taking 12 people. If you want to come, go there now because the, when, the, when the 12 spots are gone, and, and some of them are gone already even before I, I talked about it today. So if you want to do it, then now is the time uh, uh, to do it. The, there's room for two additional people in the tile house and then others will be in houses surrounding the tile house, but we'll be meeting every day at the tile house and doing our work there. So um, if you are interested, go to the, the schoolforwizards.com slash circus of the senses. Uh, check it out on the page and you don't have to pay the full amount now. Just do, do $150, we'll hold your spot and, um, and we will be doing some powerful magic. Um, uh, and getting all of your senses online. So um, that's it, 631. I can't believe we actually got through all that material and uh, a little introduction to the Circus of the Senses and we did it. Um, I have loved and I always love spending this time with you. And, and right now what I'm gonna do is stop sharing my screen and go back to the comments to see if there are questions that I can answer. Uh, so let me do that right now. There we go. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, uh, so any questions that you have, just type them in the chat window right now. Um, I am not seeing any questions right now. If you do have any, um, then you can email me privately. And uh, I've loved it. Take care. Big love to all of you. Bye-bye.